um, and this new this new saying of being red pilled. You know, I am. I've been a lefty for a long, long time. I, I mentioned to you in our in our pre discussion there that you know I've run almost ten elections as a Green Party candidate. It doesn't get any any more left than that, I don't think. Um, I, I'm still socialist in a lot of my beliefs. Uh, and similar to you, I heard you talking about Crowder. Um, these conservative uh, talk show hosts have really been making their mark on me. Crowder, uh, Shapiro, uh, I watch him every day. You know what I love about Shapiro is like, he's just so objective. He calls out his own party and, cons and, he, and he's really clear about his... Um, about his biases, you know, like he, he says, we're a conservative talk show where the rest of the media who uh, leans left mostly is saying, no, 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 we're objective. And then it, it's mm -hmm. hardly objective. I mean, I had Fox News on one channel the other day, CNN on the other channel, and it, it just, it was like day and night, even from the crawler on the bottom or the graphics they're using or whatever they're trying to promote opinion wise. And, uh, and we don't have anything like that in Canada, as far as right-wing news goes. So, anyways. The crazy thing is, and that's what people want, to. You know, these people like Crowder and Shapiro and even Joe Rogan, all these other people, they get more views than these primetime news shows like CNN or, or Fox. They're getting more views and they're getting more reach and more interactions than any other major news outlet and so it, it's something that people want people want this truth they want this people to be honest about where they're coming from and so there's a real there's a real need for it mm -hmm. tell me what it's like you know we've heard uh, if you're listening to right wing talk shows or whatever uh, uh, the infiltration or, or the saturation of of Left wing professors in school, I, you know, I, you know. I said to a friend of mine, uh, eighty five percent of the media are Democrats, like registered Democrats. Like you don't think the the the, the media is left wing? I said to a friend of mine that I consider, you know, quite bright, that all the teachers in universities and colleges are all lefties, and he's like, oh come on, like mm -hmm. he like he couldn't even believe it. Now it's been you know twenty or thirty years since he's been in one of those institutions, but sometimes you're just blinded by it because uh, I never paid attention to it. I heard you say something about. Uh, Planned Parenthood or Black Lives Matter. Like, I don't even look into these groups, but to find out that they're founded on a lie, uh, a.k.a., or sorry, uh, you know, uh, such as Black Lives Matter, and then you're like, well, hang on a second. The white cops are just not killing black people indiscriminately. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's like, oh, I've been fooled all this time. Because I was mm -hmm. kind of I was neutral on on Black Lives Matter, and now I'm like, wait a second, they've they've got this whole um, uh, activist group that was founded on a lie, including the kneeling of uh, Kaepernick and all this kind of stuff, you know. Well, when the media perpetuates these racial tensions, because at the end of the day, there are more unarmed white people killed by cops. It's not a race thing; it's an abuse of power thing. We have cops who have too much power; they're not trained well enough. And they're, they're shooting a lot of unarmed people, and it has nothing to do with race. Mm. Um, I, I'm sure there are instances of racist cops out there, but the majority of it, that's not the case. The reality of the situation is there are more unarmed white people killed by cops than unarmed black people. So how do you find, how do you find your conversations going with the left down there? I mean, I, I, I love this idea in debating of, of trying to back up to a place of common ground. It doesn't matter what the issue is. So, okay, let's back up to a place where we agree and let's move step mm -hmm. by step and, and watch where we fork in the road. Uh, I asked you the other day what you thought were some of the most important questions that we're having badly or not having at all. You mentioned f free speech and then inside of that was uh, the question of Islam, I think. Uh, of course, the abortions uh, conversation is high on that list, especially now with the Americans, you know, um, introducing or, or, or not ratifying these late-term abortion law. We, we don't have a law in Canada for abortion. I was surprised about that. Um, and I'm surprised that anyone would consider it um, morally acceptable to go in in the last trimester. Like, what are you doing in the last three months going for an abortion? But it happens. I mean, you saw the, crowd, the Crowder show there last month where there's a, there's a nine-month pregnant woman going to have an abortion against the will of her, her own husband, in her words. 
And th they'll usually bring up this argument that there's always a medical reason for them, but most of the time there is no medical reason. There's hardly ever a medical reason to have an abortion in the third trimester. Right. Hardly ever a medical reason. You can talk to certified OBGYNs. They will tell you the same thing. There's hardly ever a medical reason. Most of these are people who just don't want the kid anymore. Um, so instead of putting it up for adoption, they kill it. Um, and even like we were talking about yesterday, Governor Ralph Northam, he is advocating for abortion after birth. And Murder. We have we had a bill shot down to protect the lives of abortions that fail. Like so children that survive abortions, um, we had a bill that would provide them medical care. And they shut that down. So even children who survive abortions, they do not want to protect them. They do not want to provide them any medical assistance, nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's a really scary time that we live in, um, especially in America. And even if you look at, I don't know how familiar you are with Roe v. Wade. Most of the arguments had nothing to do with women's rights. A lot of these people were influenced by eugenists and populationists. And if you actually look at the court decisions these, are, these justices were influenced by their, their clerks and other people, who, and they had nothing to do with women's rights. There is no women's rights argument in abortion. Hmm. And what, what do you think it was that turned you around as far as you said you're, uh, you know, you're, you're a social justice warrior, you're typical SJW and, and in school or when you were younger, and what, what do you think it is that that turns you around like I mean I'm way later to the party turning it around I blame it on my age uh, I think I heard you say on another podcast who is it was it Churchill said that uh if, if you're young and you don't vote left or you're not socialist yeah if, you if have no heart if you're, if you're not a socialist in your 20s um you have no heart and if you're not a conservative when you're older you have no brain <laughs> Uh, so I, I think the big thing for me was being lied to. I had so much disinformation thrown at me about all these different cases like Black Lives Matter and, and different cases. And then once I saw the facts and I saw what was really going on, I was I was appalled that I had believed all this because uh, Myers-Briggs, I'm ESTJ. So I have like no emotion usually in my decision making. I'm very a very logical person. So seeing all this, I was like, Holy shit, I've been lied to this whole time. Um, and it really made me more diligent in, in fact-finding, even on things that are pushed from other conservatives, because we live in this, this era of almost post-truth. We're really not true, and you have to figure it out on your own. Because we're, like you said, you look at CNN and Fox, and it's two totally different things. Um, so that's really what turned me off, was this being lied to from the Democratic Party, being lied to in this outrage culture, getting outraged over things that I shouldn't have been outraged over. Um, but they do it so well. They play on these emotions. And I think that's when I'm debating with liberals, especially at my school, I try to steer the conversation away from this emotional moralist argument and, and say, let's talk about facts, especially in regards to socialism. Let's talk about where socialism has actually been tried and what the consequences of that have, have been. Let's not talk about moral arguments or how you feel or there's people who are in so much debt or this or that. Um, let's talk about facts. Let's talk about how we got there and how we're going to get out of it realistically. So, uh, in your conversations down there, what do you find in are the hot topics? Not maybe for you to broach, but I, I mean, are you any less um, offended now <laughs> that you're? Or are you just offended about different things? Because uh, you know, my level of frustration hasn't subsided at all. It just seems to be focused on different people and different issues. Yeah, I think I've I've gotten more upset about things that attack the values of the Constitution, like free speech that kind of thing, or things just being blatantly ignored and there being a double standard. Like with Ilhan Omar, how she described 9-11, a, a horrific attack on American soil and American people. As she described it as, quote unquote, some people did something. That is how she described it. And she has been advocating for the release of a Muslim Brotherhood leader with terrorist ties. And that's being ignored. And when anyone talks about this, the left has been labeling it as an incitement to violence against Ilhan Omar. Because we disagree, uh, we disagree on an issue. 
And so now we're... Yeah, because we're directly quoting her. Oh, yeah. That is exactly what she said. Mm, and people are being told that they are endangering the life of Ilhan Omar for directly quoting her. And there's an attack on free speech. There's an attack on American values. And, you know, she, she's been caught having anti-Semitic tweets, saying anti-Semitic things, giggling in an interview talking about Al-Qaeda. Mm-hmm. Who giggles when talking about Al-Qaeda? Mm-hmm. It's yeah. awful, and we're not even allowed to speak about it, or, or we have an incitement to violence, which is one way to censor speech by saying that you're trying to create an incitement to violence. Yeah, we passed That's a law a about it in Canada. Speech. We actually passed a law, you know, banning the criticism of uh, of a certain faith. Meanwhile, uh, all the rest of them, especially Christians, are fair game, and I'm I'm fine with. It. Hey, I, I I like the mocking of religions and races. I think you know the comedians <laughs> out there are getting silenced. They're they're getting. They're self-censoring themselves, and we've lost our, our whole sense of humor. I mean, you, you should be able to take a shot at someone without get, uh, them getting all offended. And you talk about the lies, and I, I come from, I'm, I'm incensed more than a little because I feel like, like you're not just lying to me. You're lying in a massive scale in the media and trying to convince everyone of, of these mm-hmm. these lies. And, and, and I, I just feel responsible to a certain extent to, you know, help people realize that this, you know, facts are facts. And, you know, the, the old idea that, uh, you know, we should be enraged and we should be more concerned about our feelings than we should facts is, you know, mm-hmm. is, is difficult for, for me. So I think I, I'm certainly coming from a, a place of, you know, it's nothing about how many people I got following me or nothing about being more famous than I am or anything. This is about getting the word out. Like, think for yourself, dude. This is this is coming straight from the media. The, you know, the wage gap. That's the first one that got me, the gender wage gap. Like, come it's on. Are, are you serious? And then, and then so it, it just perpetuates. I think I saw something come out of uh, the UK the other day with they're going to dispel all the myths about the, the gender pay gap. I'm like, okay. All right, finally, somebody's going to try talk truthfully about it, and then it was the other way. It was like, oh no, it's still there, and it's mm-hmm. real, and they don't take into account any of, you know, interest differences, uh, you know, childbirthing, child rearing, yeah. you know. It's incredibly ignorant because in the most ega- the more egalitarian a society is, the more the differences between men and women grow. Because men and women are biologically different, and it's really disparaging this whole, well, they're not in the same job field, so they're not equal. It's disparaging to women like my mother or other mothers who chose to be a stay-at-home mom. They chose to do something, and they did it, and I think that's success. And we should not have our success as women equated to what men do and say we're not successful until we're in the same job fields. Because guess what? Women don't want to lay bricks. Women don't want to be in construction. Women don't generally want to be in STEM fields. They want to do things that are more nurturing, like education and nursing. That's why those are primarily primarily female-dominated fields, education and nursing, because we are biologically different. We have this nature to, to nurture and take care of people, and it's incredibly disparaging to women who choose those fields to say, well, you're not good enough because you're not doing the same job as a man. I think it's an awful idea to have women drafted into the war. Where we we're having that conversation now, where women may be drafted into war, and guess what? That's going to hold men back. I hate to I hate to say it, but we're not on the same physically and biologically to do the same things men do on the battlefield to hold the same to hold our weight and keep up with them. Mm-hmm. That's just biology. How do you find your treatment as a, a young conservative in the States having the opinion that you have? I mean, uh, I retweeted someone the other day, uh, who was that? I can't remember exactly. Uh, and they're like, oh yeah, racist bigot. I mean, and, and this is, this is, you know, this is a frustrating part for me because I'm still left wing. I, I hold both positions. I don't know what you call me, but uh, the one, the positions that I'm most, yeah, well, th- thank you. Uh, the positions that I'm most passionate about right now are, are, I guess, right-wing supported issues. I thought the left used to stand for freedom of speech, but now they're telling you words are violent. Words aren't violence unless you're saying, go kill this guy or go hurt these people or mm-hmm. go hurt this. Like, I mean, I get that, you know, uh, call, words could be violence, but, that, but that's illegal. 
So tell me about uh, some of the reaction of, you know, being a Trump supporter, uh, you know, wearing a MAGA hat or, or just being a young white woman that is a conservative. Because, you know, and this is, I was said to you the other day, Candace Owens, thank you very much. A good looking black conservative woman that can speak for, for some of the people that, uh, you know, are traditionally, you know, thought of as Democrat. Mm hmm. So I, I always think it's funny because people will call me things like racist, bigot, Nazi, and I'm like, I'm Jewish. <laughs> so I, OK, a Jewish Nazi. That's a new one. Yeah. Um, but they, they really hate when people go outside their bubble and it's really hard for them to deal with people like Candace Owens, a black conservative or me, a Jewish conservative, because what do you what do you say? How are you going to talk to me about oppression when I'm Jewish? What are you going to tell me about that? I mean, and talk about wage gaps and this and that and wealth inequality. My my family worked their way up. My dad barely graduated high school. My mom didn't go to college and they worked their way up. They worked their way up the ladder. They worked their asses off and they got to a better place in society because they wanted to work. They didn't take handouts. And so I think it's just they don't really know what box to put me in. Because I have similar experiences to a lot of people who are crying about oppression. Um, but then they get to me and they don't know what to do. So I, I also think that makes my reach a little bit further because I can say, OK, I've, I've had these same experiences as you. I know what it's like to be poor. I know what it's like to have money. And so how do we get you out of this situation? How do we work your way up? How do you make capitalism your best friend? You can take advantage of the system and work your way out of it instead of telling people to give you something. And I think me and my family are a really good example of that because um, we didn't always have everything. Mm -hmm. uh, your Twitter handle for anyone that's watching right now that wants to go over and follow you. I, I, I love it. Um, I, and every time someone likes you, one of your tweets, because you know I don't have you on follow first or anything like that, but as soon as somebody likes one of your I'm like, look at her. There she is again. So it's at St. Clair <laughs> Ashley, right? Yes, St. Clair Ashley. S-T-C-L-A-I-R. A S H L E Y on Twitter. So St. Clair Ashley on Twitter. Go touch her up. Um, how long have you been a, 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 a you know a mini Twitter star? Because man, you got some traffic, and I've never seen anyone with you know right around the fifty thousand uh, following mark get so much action. Like you, your action is disproportionate to your following. Your following is decent, but man, you're getting a lot of action on your tweets. So I've had the account for a while, but I didn't really, I didn't even have a photo or my name up on the account until recently, about maybe seven, eight months ago. Oh, really? And then, yeah, around September, October, things really started to pick up. I only had maybe three, 4,000 followers around September, October. Oh, and really? Everything just blew up. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, what? And all of a sudden, it just... It doesn't stop. I keep growing, and it's awesome. I think it's it's really cool that I, I'm able to get these ideas out there, that I'm able to have a platform to speak my words out and get them out to all kinds of different people because I talk. There's so many people who will DM me from all parts of the country and the world who are like, "Thank you so much for for standing up for these values. Thank you so much for being outspoken because that takes a lot of courage, especially today." To even say something, it takes a lot of courage. Mm -hmm. And so, how's that look at school? <laughs> you know, I I trigger a lot of people uh, on my campus, but it doesn't really bother me too much because it just makes me feel more like I'm right. I, I've dealt with bias from teachers because of my views. I've dealt with marking down in grades because of my views. I've dealt with people calling me a Nazi because I, I wore a Steven Crowder shirt on campus. No. I was asked to, yeah, Steven I was Crowder. Asked to leave, I was asked to leave a diversity summit at my school <laughs> because I was wearing a Steven Crowder shirt. So much for um, diversity of opinion or thought. It's, oh, right? wow. You know, and I really like Shapiro. So, Shapiro said the other day, maybe this is tied to his book, but uh, how diversity isn't the be-all and end-all unless you're in a group, like a, a church. Okay, you're all rowing in the same way. You all have the, the same beliefs. Then diversity is good. Okay, you're on a hockey team or a, or a sports team or you're in the army and you're all rowing one way. Diversity is good. But then if you don't have anything that connects you, diversity is nothing but divisive. Right. 
So I thought that yeah. was really interesting, and it, it seems like common sense, but I'm like, oh, that's a powerful concept. And yeah, I can I buy into you know like this mantra: diversity is our strength. Oh, please. Then why do so many people that come to our countries decide to live in certain areas only with their own people of diversity so great? You know, and this and it, it ends up being racist. This diversity for diversity's sake actually ends up being racist. We see this in instances of like the SAT. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the SAT scores in the United States, but we have it. I think it's equal opportunity at something like that. Um, but basically, Asian people have to score 400 points higher on the SAT than African Americans. Well, they didn't always because there was too many Asians getting into places like Harvard. They're, yeah, but they're now like, well, they wait have a second. To score higher based on race. <laughs> so then you subsidize the the black community, and then they get in and drop out because they what what they you know they got there without earning it or something. I, I don't know. It's, it seems so. I mean, we're all hypocrites, right? And, and I wish mm -hmm. we could start out by saying, you know what? Everything I hate about Trump is something that's inside of me that drives me nuts about myself. And most people don't see, you know, I, I see Madonna standing up, you know, in Washington at the, at the Women's March or something, saying something ridiculous. Like, I, I think about, you know, bombing the White House or killing the president yeah. every day. And I'm like, and you don't see how you two are like brother and sister. We're all kind of the same that way. So I find it so hypocritical that, or it's interesting that the hypocrites on the left are like, oh, no, our hypocrisy is fine. Well, the worst thing, is, it's so hypocritical because when you ask people why do you hate Trump, they'll say he's a racist and a misogynist. And, and it's like, okay, well, do you remember Bill Clinton locked up more African Americans than anyone in the history of the United States? JFK watched interns give his colleagues blowjobs. Like, they are all kind of fucked up. But for some reason, they want to stick on Trump for a tape from 11 years ago. And mm. because he said MS-13 is a bunch of animals, mm. which they'll take out of context and say he hates Mexicans, which he doesn't. Um, but beside that, most presidents are a little messed up. I think you kind of have to be to want that much power. But they've all done so many messed up things. Obama's the one who had kids in cages at the border, for God's sake. Mm. And it's just so hypocritical because if you look at anyone, any president, most of them have done some messed up stuff. So how do you think this plays out? I appreciate your take on it only, um, well, because I appreciate your take on it, but how do you think this all plays out? Like the pendulum has swung, uh, it's swinging back and it's painful. Hey, we know what happens when the, the political pendulum swings left to right. If you're in the middle of it, you get hurt. And that's not great. Mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of people gonna gonna get hurt with the changing of policy and the and the changing of political will. Uh, we had Obama. You had Obama for two terms. Uh, you know, eight years. I was so hopeful, and 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 even uh, up here in Canada, when our liberal government came in, you know, he Trudeau marched down, uh, you know, uh, uh, to the to uh, Parliament with his gender parity. Uh, uh, cabinet and I'm like oh yes this is it's a new day we were so glad to get well, I was so glad to get rid of the conservative who was uh, Harper now we look at Harper and we go oh so that's what a real man looks like no we hated him when he was in power uh, <laughs> but how, how do you think this all you know we've seen social media Twitter Facebook uh, the banning of um, uh, Alex Jones like are, are, like I'm grown up to, to to decide for myself what's offensive. I don't need Twitter and Facebook and YouTube telling me. Faith Goldie in Canada, things like that. So, how do you think once the pendulum finishes its swing to the right, you know, are we going to land in the middle somewhere? Are we going to have, a, you know, a chance to have reasonable dis discussions? And I could be wrong on this, but I kind of feel that we're at, we're at each other's throats more than we ever had. Well. It, I guess if you look at over the last couple hundred years, that's not completely true because we had a civil war, you know, including, you know, of 1812 to, against you guys. Oh, I think we burned your White House down. Um, but no, I mean, so no, we're not at each other's. Here's, here's the lie that I fell for, my own lie, which is, you know, the biggest problem sometimes because you come up with the lies, is I, I, I had this narrative that men and women were further apart that the cultural divide or the informational divide was wider than it's ever been and deeper than it's ever been, and that we were more uh, violent with each other. Like, we, we just don't have the patience. And I also 
believe that on the left and right. And it turns out, I think I do, you know, through kind of psychology and deep dives into some of these, uh, you know, these online uh, lectures, I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe this isn't true. And so what I've come up with now is it's actually the extremes on both sides of the, on the both, on the tail ends of the distribution, which is the vast minority of the people have this new platform called social media and they've got us believing because they're so fucking loud. They've got us in the, the, the moderate middle where we all have all these shared values and beliefs that they are the majority and they speak mm -hmm. for us and we're like, shut up. Meanwhile, the people in the middle just don't say anything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think we don't we don't have enough people speaking up. I hate to admit it, but I think socialism will be coming to America and eventually will rise up and swing back. But I think especially with the popularity of people like AOC and Bernie and, you know, if, if Hillary hadn't rigged it against Bernie, I, I do believe he would have won. Mm -hmm. um, we have this need and no one's really ad really addressing it because Conservatives can address the same needs. Chief education, that sounds awesome, but we can do it through other means rather than taxing people out the wazoo. Um, these high education costs first got started because the government was guaranteeing each student $10,000 in student loans. So from a business perspective, why would colleges not raise tuition prices when each student is guaranteed all this, all this money? And so... I think there needs to be a conversation where the right kind of mimics exactly what the left is saying, but from a conservative standpoint. There's ways to achieve affordable health care without government intervention. There's a way to achieve education without all this taxing. Um, and so I think unless we do that and unless we play their game from this uh, adhering to people's what they deeply want, we want to adhere to people's physical and psychological needs, right? Um, and and the, the right is really bad at doing that. They're really bad at appealing to people's emotions from a logical standpoint, right? So we can use facts and statistics to say, hey, we can get, get you out of this situation. Hey, we can make your life better. Hey, you don't have to be on welfare the rest of your life. Um, but I think unless we do that, we're going to swing to the left or we're going to be more socialist. Um, especially since the main reason people want to vote for Bernie Sanders, all the polls show, is because of free education. So unless we address these things, these burning needs on the other side, we are going to swing to the left. And it's sad, especially since so many conservative voices are being censored online and we're, we're looked at like a bunch of racist nut jobs. Um, so I think we need to, we need to, lean away from the less important issues that are constantly brought up and build a platform similar to theirs with our, with our views, mm -hmm. take a little bit of their ground game because their, their strategy is incredible. If you, if you ever have time, you should read blueprint, how the Democrats won Colorado, every Republican everywhere should care. Their ground game is incredible. And they will play this game for years and years and years and years until they're winning states left and right, left and right, left and right. And, and slowly we see states like my state in Colorado, where we're almost entirely blue now. And it's really incredible to see their ground game and how they're picking these people up. So I think unless conservatives pick up on that game, we're kind of fucked. Yeah. Do you hold any socialist positions at all, any left positions at all on any of the top, or have you completely switched? Because I still hold on to a few, you know, I think we, I, I've always said a little bit of socialism's good. I think we need a mix of capital, but this idea that uh, socialism is going to fix everything is just ridiculous. And I would have voted for Bernie last time if I was in the States. I would have, mm -hmm. ha if he had been the guy, I still had enough lefty in me to vote for him then. And now I look at him, I'm like, no, never. I would never make that vote now. So I guess I care about a lot of the same things they do, but I have a different way to achieve them, right? Like, again, with education, we shouldn't have guaranteed government student loans. If we took away those guaranteed $10,000 for each student, Colleges would have no choice but to lower their tuition costs because no one's going to be able to afford it. That's why it, it kept rising. Um, so I, I do. I guess they're left wing issues that I care about, but right wing solutions. Same with healthcare. There's a way to achieve that without all this this taxing and government intervention. Mm -hmm. 
So a, a lot of those issues I do care about. I think the one that that is not typical right wing that I do hold is that is my questioning of what we should do about automation. Like, okay, Tucker was talking about this with Ben Shapiro, driverless trucks. That is That employs the most people without college degrees. The most men without college degrees is truck driving. And what are we going to do? Are we just going to get rid of these millions and millions of jobs because of automation? What are we supposed to do? Should we put safeguards in places to protect these? Because that will be so many people who are out of a job. And is the solution to that UBI like Andrew Yang wants? But then what do we do about the welfare system? And do we keep having all this, these different things? So that's really the only thing I struggle with is what are we going to do when automation takes over tons and tons of jobs over the next decade or two, because it will happen. We're seeing it now, but I think we'll see it on a more widespread scale in the next decade or two. So how do we combat that? And I think that would be more socialist methods to combat it. Mm-hmm. But that's really the only one I have more socialist views on solution-wise. Okay, so if we can pick apart the issues, and then capital punishment, for or against? Against. Okay. So, and I, like I, in, in no for, cases do you think it's ever. Uh, 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 um, uh, no, unless we want to start killing pedophiles, I don't agree with capital punishment. Okay. No. Um, <laughs> that would be the only. Did one. you ever support but it? I, I did until Me too. I worked on a a death penalty trial about a year ago. I was on a death penalty trial, and this it was an eighteen year old kid. And he, you know, he watched his mom shoot up heroin and meth since he was nine years old. And he got in with the wrong crowd and he, and he shot two people. And they wanted to give this kid the death penalty. And, and I got some sympathy because I'm like, you know, if this kid would have grown up in the same situation I did, he wouldn't have done that. And I don't know what I would be like if I was watching my mom shoot up heroin and meth since I was nine years old. What do you do? Um, so it, it just caught, obviously what he did was very wrong. Mm-hmm. I think he knows what he did was wrong. But do we have the right to take his life for that? Um, especially when people grow up so underprivileged, so in such bad circumstances. What do we do? Do we have the right to say, okay, this kid grew up in a way and he has a, he has a really low IQ. The kid was super stupid. So what do we do? Should we kill him for this? Um no, but should he be punished? Yes, he ended up getting 64 years. Um, so that really changed my perspective because I saw this kid. I, I listened to all of his phone interviews. I listened to all of his phone calls with his mom and people he cared about. And you begin to see it in a different light, um, especially when your job is to try to not get someone killed. And that was my job. I had to figure out why shouldn't we kill this kid? So then if we take abortion, is there any circumstance that you're obviously against your pro-life? Is there any, under any circumstance where you feel that abortion should be illegal or you'd right down the middle, no, it should be illegal? I mean, how do we make it illegal now? The, the force is kind of out the bar. I think no. the only case it should be accepted. So I, I really, I don't know how I feel. I feel like when you can take a pill, you know, they have the abortion pill, that I'm iffy on that, but it doesn't seem that bad to me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they have things like plan B and all these other things. So before a heartbeat, really, that's where I agree because the, the abortion pill, you can only take up to 10 weeks. And I think that's when, um, a heartbeat's formed anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, and then any other cases after that, I think should only be medical, medically necessary where the life of the mother is endangered, so- not psychological health or any of that bullshit they try to throw mm-hmm. at you medically necessary or the mother will die. So wouldn't the uh, counter argument then be we're going to force all these young women that want an abortion underground into, you know, conditions that, you know, wouldn't be appropriate? (laughs) So should we legalize all drugs for the same reason or prostitution? Uh, I think we should. I I absolutely do not think we should. I think we should legalize drugs. It's the only way to make sure the supply is clean and the people that need to get off it. So so actually legalizing drugs and prostitution both does not change the black market. In fact, if you look at places like Amsterdam, the black market rises. Abuse among women, especially with legalized prostitution, <laughs> rises. Hmm. And they're just, you're turning pimps into entrepreneurs. You're turning <laughs> abusers of women into entrepreneurs. And, and, and that's what they're looked at. And, and if you look, I think it was Dennis Hoff. He, he ran a brothel in Las Vegas. He, he died and ended up winning an election for senator or congress or something, even after he died. 
in Las Vegas, but you listen to the stories of these girls that worked for him, and it's no different than when mm. it's illegal. Except they're looked at as, as entrepreneurs and people who should be sitting politicians. And I find that wrong. If you look at the statistics, usually when they first legalize drugs, it looks great. But then you look at it a few years down the road and everything goes south again. The black market rises. In fact, sometimes it's even stronger than it was before legalization. And I just don't I don't think it's good. Statistically, it hasn't. Right now you see in, in places like Portugal, it looks good right now, but I can guarantee you they'll go to the place Amsterdam is in a few years. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm playing devil's advocate continuing down that line here. Don't you think it's kind of um, a selective judgment as far as what – I mean there's pros and cons for everything, right? So I can give you uh, pros – for the legalization, the clean supply, the taxation of its huge revenue stream, uh, you know, you can use some of that money to get people into treatment. If they come in and say, "Hey, I got a problem with this drug," maybe you can take care of them first class because they're coming to you first. So, how do you decide which of the arguments you attach the most weight to, and then become, uh, you know, a proponent of as far as you know, selling that idea? So, I don't think drug use should be criminalized the way it is. I mean, we have issues with overpopulation in, pr in prisons, but I think the selling of drugs absolutely should. Um, and, and that's the distinction I make because a lot of times people who use it, they do have a problem and what do we do? We should put them through rehab or do things to help them. They shouldn't end up in a prison cell because recidivism rate is 76% in United States prison. That is 76% of people who go into the U.S. prison system will reoffend, And that rises the lower your ages, and we're, we're locking up 18-year-olds for, for joints and drugs that they really shouldn't be locked up for. Most of these people are self-medicating. Most drug use is, is recreational. It's not going to hurt people. So I, I don't think you should be illegal and criminalized the way it is. I think there should be a different solution to that, but I think the selling of drugs absolutely should be illegal and criminalized. Mm -hmm. So what what are your plans then, uh, other than uh, being active on social media? Do you have any political aspirations? What do you, I mean, here, here we, I think we, even though, you know, the, it doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum on, I think we're all kind of uh, motivated by, by, by trying to help, right? And, and you know, these Antifa pe people that are out there committing violence in the name of anti-fascism, I kind of I believe they want to help. They want to be part of the solution, and they're enraged that you know uh, you know there's so much injustice out there. I got it, but um, you know outside of you know doing what I do here, you know I, I, sometimes I get off the off the interview and I'm like shit. I don't even know. Like, what am I doing this for? Like, is, <laughs> am I changing anyone's mind? Going to war on social media is not changing anyone's mind. Like, you know, uh, what do you, what do you think is the most um, proactive and effective use of our time moving forward, uh, you know, to just get an idea out there that it will create a discussion, not create violence. And hopefully, I mean, these are, and we talked about this in our last conversation, there's so many big issues that we really need to have an educated discussion about. And we can't just stop by saying racist, bigot, homophobe, end of discussion. Mm -hmm. It's like on the abortion issue. Well, that's not a human life. Ah, uh, what? <laughs> you can't even discuss think, anything further from after that. You know, like the philosopher Cobb said, just have have the courage to have your own understanding. Come to the come to your own understanding. Be courageous enough to to speak that out to to tell people how you feel, to tell people why certain ideas are wrong or right, and. Getting involved in local politics is really w way more important than people realize because it all starts from there. And so, and we'll, so yeah, I think ahead. it's really important to get involved in local politics, especially young people. Help your city build a good bench, right? And that means getting people who can run on, on tickets, who can get involved, who can, who do have a chance of winning, who, who hold the same values as you and who are going to do good things for your city. Mm. Um, so I think especially with young people, it's really important that we get involved. It's really important that young people run for things like student government association at their colleges and schools. Because that, that's a great way to get involved. Um, and just mobilizing people to actually do something because people will sit on, on Twitter all day with trig trigger fingers and they won't actually do anything because 
Antifa, I, I can't stand them. I think they're terrorists. I don't think they have any goodwill. But at least they're out there doing something. The left is really great at protesting. Mm -hmm. They're fantastic at protesting. They get coverage everywhere they go for these Antifa mm -hmm. protests. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking in San Francisco on May 4th. And we had to beef up security because Antifa is already saying they're going to be there. And we equate that to violence. Our lives are in danger because we're having a rally for free speech. And so I, I don't think I think they are fascists. I think they are terrorists. Everywhere they go, they have this violence about them. But they are good at getting crowds. The left is great at protesting and creating these marches and, and creating this appeal to emotion where people are like, I want to be behind that. I feel like I'm doing something. And the right is really bad about that. People should have been protesting about Jesse Smollett to this day. They should still be protesting about that injustice. He was able to throw some money around and get off free. That's wrong. That is this rich leftist privilege that no one's talking about. And, and, what's... and the crazy thing about Democrats is it's a bunch of rich people telling poor people that they're poor because of rich people, so they should vote for rich people. Mm. And it's this incredible hypocrisy. Well, they, they're getting off scot-free. Jesse Smollett knew the Obamas, so he was able to get off, even though we think to hate crime, furthered racial tensions, and, and broke the law. Now, what's but all more... 16 charges were dropped, and so I think... We really need to mobilize. If there's something you're passionate about, get out there and do something. Organize a protest. Organize debates at your school. That's a really great way. Or just debates in general. Right. Um, uh, that's a great way to get discussion going, but people are, are kind of lazy. Oh, yeah, definitely. And there's nothing more insidious, I don't, you know, to me these days. And I'm, I, I'm almost sure he's pretty decent human being that everyone makes mistakes but he's not backing off it again and I'm just you know I kind of fall on the side of like okay so you live in a society that that's good enough that you have to invent a hate crime to to further <laughs> this false narrative that that uh, the, the 360 million people in the United States of America well, at least half of them are racist bigots. Like I just, mm -hmm. I can't, I, I can't understand it. But I'm having a hard time understanding the left anyway these days. But uh, including these social media companies that are practicing censorship, how long do you think it's going to be that you continue to have a Twitter account? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to jinx it you. It depends on how risky I'm feeling, you know. Right. Because I, I, I've been banned before. I was banned for saying gender dysphoria as a mental disorder, which it absolutely is. It's on the DSM-5. Um, that's science, but apparently science is hateful content. Um, and you have people who are being banned for tweeting hashtag learn the code. Um, so I, I don't think there's any telling when someone's going to get banned because I really didn't think out of all the things I said. I mean, I... I talk about the obesity epidemic and how it's awful that they have all these obese people on magazine covers all the time, and I don't get banned for that. But I get banned for saying science. So mm. there's really no telling how much longer I'll be around, Jim. <laughs> there's no telling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate your time and your candor. Thanks for coming in. I, uh, <laughs> I hope to be able to touch you up uh, down the road with some of your takes on things. And uh, I really appreciate your time for coming in on a Sunday. I know you got family things, and it looks like a beautiful day <laughs> there in Colorado. So just on the way out, if you've got anything you want to wrap up with or tell people how to find you, uh, the time's yours. Okay, I am on Twitter at St. Clair Ashley and on Instagram at Ashley and St. Clair. And thank you, Jim, for having me on. Absolutely. Uh, stay in touch <laughs> and I'll get some uh, footage out. And good luck in San Francisco. Uh, we'll touch you up when uh, you make the news again. <laughs> thank you. May 4th in San Francisco at San Francisco City Hall. At, no, May 3rd. I'm sorry. May 3rd, San Francisco City Hall at 12 p.m. If anyone's in the area, come out. Have some fun. Rally, in Tifa. <laughs> rally for uh, free speech, is it? Yes, to defend awesome. free speech. She, Thank you so much, Jim. Oh, you're welcome. I appreciate the time. Thanks a lot. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Ashley. Bye-bye. All right, bye. Ashley St. Clair, if you need her. Uh, coming in via Skype, I will have some video of that up later, if you care. To the peeps on Facebook. Uh, thank you for chirping in. Sorry, I wasn't taking questions today, so I wasn't watching the feed. And um, uh, again, I'm not really sure what the hell I'm doing this for, but I'm hoping that you find the conversations interesting and that maybe um, you 
of a little enlightenment that uh, uh, comes as a result of it. So, Ashley Sinclair, uh, we're going to say goodbye for now. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. I'm a little lost. Do we have any sports on? Maybe I'll watch some old boxing and UFC from last night. Uh, at Jim Fannin, youtube.com slash Jim Fannin. Um, subscribe. Hit the notification bell. And, oh, I put um, Peppa, my, my podcast uh, partners, man, they, they run a really good uh, system there. Um, their podcasting service includes uh, propagation to YouTube. So I think I had about 100 and some odd Pro, uh, podcast up from oh, going all the way back to most of my stuff on 610 CQTB, but none of my stuff from uh, 1220 CHSC. Uh, but last night we managed to upload while uh, uh, Hot Scott and uh, Matthew James Blake were here. We had a little jam and uh, watched some fights last night. I managed to upload all the old shows and they went up to the YouTube channel. So there's another 100 shows on the YouTube channel, but it's just a picture of me in the corner with a, like a voice. You know, the EQ, the voice meter at the bottom, and uh, and, and no video. So uh, I think that's pretty cool. So check us out on the, the YouTube, and I'll catch you on the rebound. Peace out. Catch you on the YouTube. Catch me outside. Say goodnight, Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy.